Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Let me ask you something. Can you see the person that is sitting beside you? Can you see them? Don't be shy. Yes, look at them. Don't be shy. But can you see their soul? T take a few moments. Look into their eyes. Please do, please do, look into their eyes. Can you see their souls? Are you seeing any souls? Now, do me a favor. Take out your mobile phone. And look at the other person's mobile phone. Now, can you see their soul? <laughs> if you hold on with me over this presentation, I will tell you how uh, your mobile phones and the data that they hold can reveal your soul and can help you grow. Now you can put back the mobile phones. Thank you. As human beings, we leave traces of our activities, our whereabouts, our intents, our likes, dislikes in everyday life. We leave it in forms of uh, data trails in the same way that insects leave pheromones in their wakes. It is data from social networks. It is data from phone activities, data from your emails. However, more than 90% of this data never goes analyzed. In the same way that you could say that 90% of your brain, of yourself, goes unexplored. And the problem is that we are limited as humans. We've got a limited brain. We've got a limited capacity. Sometimes we cannot even answer the most basic questions about ourselves. We make decisions based on the wrong judgments. And a lot of times, we don't have time to think or reason. We need to pull our gut feelings. We need to ask our intuition and go forward. Data could become your new guts. Data could become your new intuition. Now, let me ask you, how fast do you think you can generate data? How fast do you think you generate those data trails and acquire that data? Well, as an individual, we receive data from our sensors, from our eyes, our ears, our nose, our touch. All those sensing capabilities, they get input that goes through our central nervous system, goes into our cortex, and fires a number of events. Some of them, they get thrown away. Some of them, they get processed. Some of them, they get stored. Now, the speed at which the brain is getting that data is roughly 100 megabits per second. 100 megabits per second is the internet speed that you get in a good home today that has optical fiber. Now, that is for one single brain. What about collectively, as a humanity? So in this graph, I show over the x-axis the projection over 40 years. And on the y-axis, I have shown the speed at which we can collect data. And there are two lines. <clears throat> the white line is the speed at which collectively all humans in this planet are grabbing data through their brains. And the black line is the internet capacity. Now, if you take the 100 megabits that I told you about before for one single human being, and you multiply by 7 billion people in this planet, you get that number today, which is roughly about one exabit per second. Now, that's not the important thing. You can see that the line goes up, the white line goes up, as there will be more and more humans in the planet over time. The interesting thing is that that line 
will cross the internet capacity around 2030 to 2035. And then the internet capacity will grow exponentially. Now, the point being is that the internet around 2030 will have enough capacity so that it can, uh, all the information that your brain receives and records, it will be able to share it over the internet. Now, this may sound crazy, right? Sometimes I think it does. Now, uh, there are crazier people that have been trying this before, that have been trying to record all their life. Let me introduce you to Gordon Bell. Gordon Bell, he's a scientist, uh, works for Microsoft in the Bay Area. And about 10 years ago, he decided that he was going to switch his life completely into digital. No more analog for him. He decided that he was going to go paperless, and he started carrying around all sorts of sensors and devices. He carries around a camera that takes snapshots of interesting events that happen in his life, the do video recording, he carries a pedometer, he carries a heart rate uh, monitor, he carries a voice recorder, he knows everything that is going around him. He has a record of his email, his videos, everything. Now, you would wonder, how much is that data? He's been doing this for 10 years. It sounds like a lot of data, right? Well, you see this? It all fits in here. This is a 64 gigabyte USB drive. It costs 50 euros. A decade of his life was 44 gigabytes. A decade of your life fits in here. Now, you know, there's lots of data there, but where, where are those data trails? Can you see them around? What are those data pheromones? I don't see them. Now, they used to be in your computer. Now, they're everywhere. Every time you do a transaction with a company, every time you go online, your social networks, your health company, your financial company, electricity bills, all that information is sitting there and is revealing who you are, what you are doing. And in a sense, as the internet is becoming mobile, all that information that exists out there, now you're carrying it in your pocket. You're carrying it in your mobile phone. Because the mobile phone has so many sensors today that it's capable of listening when you are not hearing and seeing when you are not watching. It is capable of being your extended ears and your extended eyes. It is capable of storing information and augmenting your data trial uh, capabilities. Now, this is so much data, and data is becoming so important, it's becoming the new oil. And to process this oil, we will need new refineries. In the same way that we take petrol, and we transform it into plastic, into chemicals for pharmaceutical products, into kerosene. We will take data and we will transform it into tips, advices, recommendations for health, for uh, uh, lifestyle, for uh, self-development. Maybe why not get some money? You know, you may be willing to sell your data to the devil and get some money in return. But the important thing is that to process all this data, you probably need to have it in one place. And we will see the emergence of private clouds, of private databases that bring all this data together, put it in one place, replicate it, back it up, and store it. So what's, what's the future? What's the future like? Imagine that you have all these personal data trails in one place. And now you wanna, you've, you've processed them, you've stored them, and now you want to apply them, you want to extract value out of them. What I envision is an ecosystem of applications, an ecosystem of applications that will be able to take value out of that data and give you useful services. And in the same way that we used to develop applications for the computer and then for the cloud, 
Now we're going to be building applications for the individual, for the person, as a data representation of itself. You're going to be downloading applications onto yourself. Now, all this sounds very exciting, doesn't it? But at the same time, I feel a bit uneasy. I don't know about you. You know, so much data, so much information, so much potential. Communist governments, they understood the value of data very well. They knew that by having data, they could control people. We in democratic countries give this data away every day. We don't even think about it. So it is very important that we keep control of that data, that we understand where it's sitting, we understand how it's being used, we need to control that data to control our lives. We need to be able to revoke access to that data, make sure that it's used transparently in a fair way. The good news is that there are already a number of projects that are going in this direction. Let me give you some examples. For instance, the British government just launched an initiative called MyDEX, which is giving back to the customers, structured data records for every interaction that they do with certain companies, be it the gas company, be it the energy company, be it the bank, and the user keeps control of that data. Telefonica O2 is running for the first time a trial in the UK where it's giving users control of their data in terms of browsing patterns and also phone call logs. And then finally, there is the Locker project. This is a personal database. It is an open source project where you can keep all your data, you can store it, record it, and it is private and it is safe. We all like to keep control of things, don't we? But unfortunately, there is a day <coughs> where we can't anymore. There is a day when we die and we need to decide what happens to our belongings. And we'll probably start thinking about writing a data will in the same way that we write a will for our physical properties. The data that is, will be sitting in these private databases, your data trail, will be of such importance that you have to start thinking hard what you want to be deleted, what you want to share with who. For instance, sharing with your, with your wife so she understands how you were feeling at a certain time sharing it with your kids so they understand what, was, what worked for you, your successes or your failures. And why not donate it for science in the same way that you donate your organs today? And believe me, you probably will not be embarrassed in the same way that you're not embarrassed about having medicine students looking over your organs once you're gone. Probably won't be embarrassed while having researchers looking over your data. Because the most important thing is that they will be able to build a corpus of data that will create a massive laboratory of the human species. Now, let's come back to, to the present, right? Let's see what type of applications and services can we get with all that data. And, um, let me ask you something. How many of you have fought over housework duties? You know, cleaning dishes, washing the toilet. I have. I have. Well, I'm going to tell you about a guy that has solved this problem looking through his data. Now, his name is Ben Lipkovich. He is a software engineer in the Bay Area, and um, he bought this uh, uh, notepad, and he's been recording a lot of things that are happening in his life. Rather than using it as an agenda, he's using it to record the present. So he records the um, books that he's read, the object that he's bought, but also the type of activities that he does in his home. And uh, recently, he got into an argument because he thought that he was doing a lot more housework than any of his uh, roommate. He thought that he was doing hours more than his roommate. He looked at the data and it happened to be it was only 15 minutes what he was doing. So 
the data told him the truth. He was lying to himself. Without any emotions, he started getting to terms with how much work he was doing. In a sense, I think Ben is becoming a better soul, at least in, with regard to cleaning. Now, before I came here, I ate some chocolate and I ate some broccoli. I don't know if it happens to you, but I have the feeling that depending on what I eat, my brain works better. Well, it seems I'm not the only one in on the planet. Um, this is Professor Roberts. He's a professor at Berkeley University. And uh, what he does is he compares how well his brain works and relates it to what he eats. He's developed 32 arithmetic tests that he does every day. It takes him a few minutes. And uh, he records how fast he can do this test. And then he also records what he's been eating during those days. Now, he's realized that depending on whether he cooks with butter, with oil, or different types of oil, his brain works different. Actually, it turns out to be that half a stick of butter improves his arithmetic capabilities by 33 milliseconds. <laughs> so you know what? If you have kids and you want them to be good at math, give them more butter. <laughs> now, Remember at the beginning of the talk, I told you about um, the mobile phones and your data and how I was asking you to look for the souls. Well, let me connect the dots. <clears throat> Last year, in Mexico City, we recruited 800 volunteers, 800 people, individuals, that we connected with psychologists. They worked together for six months. The psychologists did some psychology tests on these individuals with the goal to cluster these 800 people into different personality traits, looking for things like whether they were extrovert or introvert, whether they were more logical or passionate, more creative or directive. And at the same time, Telefonica built an app for their mobile phones, an app that would have access to their phone logs, to information such as the number of calls that they made, the number of people that they called, the times when they called, whether it was off working hours or not, the duration, the number of missed calls, the average time to answer a missed call. And this app had a number of algorithms which purpose was to look at these phone logs and try to see whether they could infer the psychological traits of these individuals. What do you think was the result? Or well, the surprising result is that with 87% probability, this application was able to tell these individuals their psychological traits with the same accuracy that the psychologists had told them about it. Can you imagine you had more data, how much more information you would get. Data is becoming the new psychologist. Data is becoming the new coach. Data is not cold anymore. It's not impersonal. It reveals your emotions. It can help you grow. I hope that I've given you the excitement that I share for personal data. I've told you that there is a large amount of data out there that you need to control it, you need to process it, process it. You need to get good value out of it. It may sound like science fiction, but it's already happening faster than you think. But I hope that next time you look at your phone, you look at your data, you treat your data like you treat your soul. You listen to your data like you listen to your soul. You love your data like you love your soul because it will help you grow, it will help you find your inner self. Thank you.